Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Leslie Babinski, and I'm the director of the Center for Child and Family Policy at Duke University. Thank you so much for joining us for the Salzburger Distinguished Lecture featuring Dr. Cynthia Garcia Call. The Center for Child and Family Policy sponsors the Salzburger Distinguished Lecture Series to enhance the intellectual community, not only for Duke University, but also for people across the triangle, and now due to our virtual reach, people across the United States. The lecture series features experts who've demonstrated excellence in behavioral science and theory, as well as science to policy applications. These lectures are made possible through an endowment from the Arthur Sulzberger family. And I'd like to thank Cindy Sulzberger and her husband, Stephen Green, who are joining us for today's webinar for their generous support for great lectures like this one. Thank you. Cindy and Steven. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa Genetian, Pritzker Associate Professor of Early Learning Policy Studies in the Sanford School of Public Policy, who will introduce tonight's speaker, Lisa. Thank you, Leslie. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to be here with everyone, and especially given this cross-country scope, now that we're in virtual world, um, just a few words about logistics. Dr. Garcia Cole will speak for about 40 minutes, after which we'll open for questions. I will help facilitate those questions. Um, and you can enter your questions or comments via the Q&A function on your screen. So it is now with my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Garcia Cole. I first met Dr. Garcia Cole in a somewhat official capacity when she invited me to join the editorial board of the flagship journal in child development called Child Development. I had no idea what I was doing, but I had a lot of confidence in her as the leader and editor in chief. And might I note, she took on this task of a six year appointment as editor in chief after serving another appointment as editor in chief for a journal called Developmental Psychology. Now I can tell you with a lot of confidence that money and fame are not the reasons one takes on an editor in chief position. Indeed, it is quite often the contrary and Dr. Garcia Cole exhibits all of those other reasons. It's commitment, it's compassion, it's character and it's purpose to supporting the development of children worldwide and of establishing and shaping frameworks for recognizing children's resilience and the resilience of the families and contexts in which they are nurtured. There is no other child developmental researcher or leader in the field that I can think of that has done more to broaden the field's view beyond white, Western-centric, sometimes patriarchal perspectives. And she rather has been a visionary and champion of inclusive scholarship and long been at the forefront recognizing discrimination, oppression, and migration and immigration, among other things, as shaping children's environments. Moreover, Dr. Garcia Cole does this with calm, grace, diplomacy, endurance, and even humor. It's been an honor to know her and to work with her, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing her wise words today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Garcia Cole. <laughs> All right, can you hear me now? Somebody say yes. <laughs> Lisa, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you for this wonderful invitation. Uh, I was actually looking at the people that are coming and there's a lot of people that I don't know. So I always like uh, breaking new grounds and speaking what I um, have worked on in the last 30 years um, to people who might be new to this topic. Uh, thank you for you guys to inviting me. Thank you for the funders. It's always good to have people that believe in our work and that think that it is important to have it exposed. So let me just have the first slide, if I could have it. So um, anybody, if you can remind me when I'm around 40, because you know that when you give a microphone to an academic, we get very excited about what we do and we um, keep on talking much more 
than we're supposed to. So the topic of today is inequality, racism, and COVID-19. Let me just have the next um, slide. And I have basically two arguments today. One is to prove to you through um, public data that the pandemic has had a huge impact in the economic downfall, uh, not only in the United States, but worldwide. And that unfortunately, the impact has been much worse for what we call now, um, populations of minoritized populations or populations of color. So basically these are um, people who are indigenous people of color that are overrepresented on everything that we're gonna be talking about today. Can I have the next one, please? And my argument, my second argument that I'm gonna try to substantiate today is that because the existing racism, the existing inequality, that impact is worse for BIPOC families and children. So those are the two arguments that I wanna to propose today, some recommendations, and hopefully we'll have a great discussion. So I hope that people get ready and excited and try to knock me down in my arguments. I love debate and that's part of being an academic. So let's go to the next one. So the data that I'm gonna be presenting today is showing that there's an overrepresentation in of these families in the number of hospitalizations and death, in job and income loss and in economic uncertainty. And I will show very different statistics that really portray this um, effect on food and housing insecurity. There are serious disruptions in childcare and education, again, worse than other populations. Even Lisa has shown that they have more failure to receive the CARES Act stimulus check. And that they also, as we saw last week, perhaps receiving more racial and ethnic over discrimination. And for a moment, I just wanna pause on this because this work that we've been doing has been by a group of ERSA-CD members for the Society of Research in Child Development with the complete backup from the society. And we've been able to do two things. We're gonna have um, a conference that is called the Construction of the Other, which is gonna be on May 24th, 2022. It was supposed to be last May, and but we've been moving it. And that group of people, which are Gustavo Carlo, Linda Haldosen, Lisa Lopez, and Norma Perez um, Brena, we've been working on op-eds, but we've been also working with SRCD. And I would recommend that if you're interested in more of the data and the backup for this talk today, that you look at the child evidence briefs that the society have put out. There's actually one in inequities in education that was released September 9th, 2020. Another one, December 16th, 2020, the job and income loss uh, jeopardized child well-being, which Lisa and Eshen has been part of it. And another one just now, May 10th, on childcare and COVID-19. So a lot of this information has been worked and reworked and represented by our society from SRCD. I'm very grateful. So let's go on to the data. So this is from the Department of Health and Human Services 2020, 2020 as of October 30th, 2020. I wanna bring you about to the second um, bullet where it says blacks and Hispanics represent a disproportionately greater number of COVID-19 as of October 30th, hospitalization and cases and on the death toll has been much higher for blacks. Um, there's a higher, and this is if you look at state, but if you look at district or county level, this same relationships hold. And then we also have that when we start looking at the indigenous population, and I'll show you how the statistics are very, you know, inconsistent on, you, on, on presenting the indigenous populations. 
Uh, 5% of the population living in the Navajo Nation has contracted COVID-19, which was at that point, I think it was 2.5 for the rest of the country. And they are not, which is very interesting, they are not um, only related to urban centers, which is a lot of times we see this overrepresentation in urban centers, but this has been through rural and urban centers. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is just to give you another way of looking at it. I'm very happy that we have the American Indian or Alaska natives, and if we measure them, we see that they're actually higher for hospitalization rates. This is as November 21st, 2020. Let's go to the next slide. And we also look at the death rates. And now this is December 8th, 2020. The other one was October. And by December, the indigenous populations were higher than the black in terms of death rates, which give us the importance of maintaining these statistics for all subgroups, how important that is. If those big categories of Asian, here too, you see Asian versus Pacific Islander, the difference. So it really questions our very global um, statistics. Um, let's keep on to the next one. And, you know, I want to uh, point out that the economic um, uncertainty in the income and job loss, this is a huge problem for the world. We're talking about pushing 40 to 60 million in extreme poverty um, expected by the end of this pandemic and 205 million will face crisis levels of hunger. So one of the issues at the world level is that we're going backwards in many of the statistics if we don't do something seriously, consistently, and systematically. Let's go to the next slide, please. So here, I'm going to look at income inequality and job loss on very different uh, ways to look at it. So one is that people of color are not, on, not, are not overrepresented at the top but yes, they're overrepresented at the bottom. So when inequality grows, as it's been growing in the United States in the last five, 10 years, um, we, get, we don't get the inequality on the top. We only get that inequality on the bottom. Next slide, please. And wealth, if we look at wealth, that's exactly the same thing. I mean, look at the wealth difference. The wealth was really important during the pandemic because this wealth is what you have in the bank. No, the resources that you can draw upon when you don't have employment. And this is showing you the difference in um, the wealth divide that has been growing over the last three decades. Next one, please. Here are the unemployment rates as of November of last year. And it really shows the very beginning when the lockdown and how the different populations have um, sort of normalized. And you see that, you know, only white are really back into closer. There's still some higher unemployment, but all the other lines are still recovering from the pandemic. Next slide, please. One of the issues that we have is, you know, how do you look at inequality? And these are indexes that you are um, using to really look at the constellation of ways. It's not only income, it's not only wealth, but who has computer and who has stable internet that they can work from work. And as you see, it really changes. It really shows you the inequality also in terms of type of work that they can do from work. Next slide, please. And women, women of color are, they have what it's called the double inequality. They are also very much affected and many of them are heads of households. As we know many, sometimes up to 60% of uh, women, black women are single. Um, in terms of, of having a family and being the main income. So this is really distressing because these are mothers who have this burden, not only from the pandemic and everything that's going on, but also in terms of poverty. Next slide, please. 
And the other thing that has happened, and this is worldwide, is that the double inequality, it's also because women were, are also on the front lines. So I don't know if they've ever made a gender uh, or sex uh, on the analysis of the statistics that maybe some of you might know of the death and the COVID rate and everything. We know that healthcare is way overrepresented. The nurses who are there the whole time are overrepresented. Women are overrepresented and minorities, Hispanics are overrepresented too. So let's go to the next. And here are other ways of looking at them. So they have had more trouble paying usual household expenses. Again, you might have unemployment in two populations, but because you have wealth, you can manage these kinds of expenses. But in this particular populations, they don't. Next slide, please. And so what uh, Lisa and, and a coworker has shown that not only they have these inequities in types of work, in types of exposure, in rate of COVID and rate of death, but they also did not get the stimulus check. And you know, that's, that's sort of, it's like at, even at the very end, the inequality keeps on affecting these populations. Next slide, please. Now we talk about food and housing insecurity. Again, the same kind of um, over-representations of Black, Latinos, and other um, minoritized populations. Next slide, please. And hardships of paying rent. Next slide, please. And so what we see, the data that I've presented so far is that, you know, in terms of the economic conditions, they've been much worse for people of color. But then the closing of childcare and schools, and I don't have the data to present here because it's very well represented on the child evidence briefs in SRCD. So I just welcome you. This is only 40 minutes, so I needed to cut all that information. But what we find in all the studies that have been done is that for these families, it's a lot more stressful, the, child, the closing of childcare and schools, because they don't have any way of taking care of these kids. Many of them don't work from home. And so they either need to quit their jobs or stay, you know, to be, to be able to stay home and take care of their kids. When we look at the quality of education is much worse for these kids because they don't have access to computers and internet at home. Many of them are here in Puerto Rico. I see kids in eighth and ninth grade taking classes in, um, in cell phones. I mean, I'm just, you know, algebra in a cell phone for an hour. I just can't imagine doing that. Also, they lose the food that they are expected to have for breakfast and lunches at home and all the wraparound services for um, special services for autism, for all of these kinds, learning disabilities, for special education. And they have less academic socialization because the school, one of the main purposes of school is the socialization of really thinking about how important it is to learn, how important it is to do well in school, et cetera. Can I have the next slide, please? So the last point that I have is that, you know, they, th these populations are overrepresented in hospitalizations, in death, in all the indicators of losing economic security. And now we have to also deal with discrimination. And this was a great study by the Pew Research Center, which finds that this was uh, 2020, that you know, Asian Americans were especially targeted during um, the pandemia for many, many different reasons and we are not gonna go into them right now, but they became as feeling and receiving discrimination as high or higher than the black communities, which tend to be the most overrepresented 
and discriminatory uh, uh, acts. Next slide, please. And this is different ways also that people have documented uh, for Asian Americans, the higher incidence of blaming, being blamed for the pandemia and being pushed or shoved aside or called names, et cetera, et cetera, within the pandemia. Next slide, please. And so these are ways, it's really interesting because I started looking and saying, well, how are people feeling about this kind of um, studies and this notion? And I found this wonderful study from the Pew Research Center that marks that in 2014, something has happened. And I'm wondering the historians around can tell me exactly what happened in 2014, that all of a sudden we have this, bifurcation. I have some ideas, but I would like to hear from other of saying, you know, the, the, the American dream for the Black community, for the African American community has disrupted. And we are now all of us seeing a lot more um, issues of, mob, you know, of, of being able to move from um, populations that are being exposed to racism and discrimination and prejudice. Next slide, please. So we, this is another way of thinking about it. Again, this is really interesting because look at the Pew. The Pew is not moving into measuring Asians and indigenous people. And that's very interesting, a sort of a very important research center that might not be paying attention to this phenomena as more, not only black and white and Hispanic, because those are the largest numbers, but those numbers that are either increasing or decreasing for that matter, but that they need to be talked about. Next slide, please. And again, this is another way from the Pew Research Center that you look at discrimination or racism. And, pro, and mostly, and this is a very interesting, is the age range of 18 to 29 for Hispanics and those who have some college that really are experiencing the brunt of um, the racism, the open racism that we are observing now in the country. Next slide, please. So, you know, we are all saying, I think, or many of us are saying, I guess there are some million of people out there that are not saying this, but many in my circles and many, and I'm hoping that a majority of the USA, USA residents are saying that, you know, we need to achieve racial equ equality, that enough is enough, that we should be doing something different. Next slide, please. But you know what we're finding, if we look at the statistics during the pandemic, the studies and just the public health statistics that I think I have given you enough data to say that the impact of COVID on BIPOC families and children is much worse. That in each of these kinds of indications and each of this categories looking at different indications within category, minoritized populations are overrepresented. So let's go to the next slide. So the question for us is why? And I wanna bring a little bit of my own experience with the hurricane here in Puerto Rico with Maria and with Katrina, because I had a lot of people that were working during Katrina, we were in contact trying to document what was going on. And so Katrina and Maria were two uh, episodes that really showed how the inequality and racism affects, you know, um, that a, a disaster, a pandemic, it can be a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. It always takes those that are more vulnerable and shows more of the vulnerabilities. 
Um, and so my point for the rest of the talk is that, you know, we need theoretical frameworks to understand why. It's not only economic, it's economic and something else. What do they have? Why these particular populations and why do they have in common? And what are the root causes? And, you know, my hypothesis is that it's the combination of racism, structural racism, of inequality that really puts these populations at risk. Next slide, please. So I have to go back to my origins. This is 25 years old right now. This was the first time that in child development, the words racism, prejudice, discrimination, and oppression were used to talk about children's development. And I say there the integrative model and others because in the last 25 years, people have taken this framework and tweak it and move it. Their versions for immigrants, their versions for LGBTQ, their versions for all sorts of different populations. And I'm so glad that it's been a force and a basis for others to think about. But our theoretical framework is that every society has social stratification. And in the United States, it's been basically race, social class, ethnicity, and gender, the main ways that people have been categorized. And that resources flow to these populations based on other kinds of social processes because racism, prejudice, discrimination becomes such an oppressive presence in this family's life that really curtail a lot of other resources that might be there. And it, that is done primarily by segregation. And we went through historically in this country through what we thought it was desegregation Yes, we moved in the right direction, but let me tell you that the data since the 1980s and 90s is that we are resegregating again. So all of this inhibiting environments that include schools, neighborhoods, healthcare, everything really becomes a major force in the development of families and children. Next slide, please. Last year, actually it was 2019, we had the opportunity of thinking about what do we do now? You know, why are we still talking about inequality? Why have we published so much and we've talked about it so much? And what we ended up coming up is with this theoretical framework, which I really would love for others to look at, that we need to start working with children in preconception, that really when adolescents become sexually active, we really have to start talking about what, 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 what are your plans? How, you, how do you see yourself moving into having children, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is what we are thinking about uh, right now in the National Academy of Science in this particular study. And I hope that really gives you a sense of how do we have to start thinking about if we're going to prevent this uh, effects of all disasters in these populations, we really need to start way earlier than we intervene right now. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is another um, theoretical framework that I found November 2020 that really gave us a sense um, of also how we have to be thinking. This is basically um, an adaptation of Brumf and Brenner's, but you know, it really talks about the social determinants of health and how we are finding that the social determinants of health are very powerful uh, ways of thinking about these problems. Next slide. I also like metaphors and I'm, I put those two, you know, I thought about the domino effect and also about the cascading effect and really thought that this is another way of thinking of why these populations are overrepresented in the categories that we talked about initially. Next slide, please. 
So this is what I've been arguing. No, I've been arguing that racism and inequality brings more vulnerabilities into these populations that makes the impact of any, any um, disaster, but right now we're talking about the pandemia, uh, worse in these populations. And as a world, we need to be thinking about, are we gonna go back? Are we gonna allow this major banks into our systems to really keep on bringing these populations to sometimes in the World Health Organization, they're talking about pre 1960s levels if we don't do something dramatically different for these populations. Next slide, please. So one of the things that these disasters do for us in my worldview and in my theoretical framework is that they expose the weaknesses of our existing systems. And I love this slide because there I see it and I see four different social classes in there. I don't know if you see it. So we have the working man who carries the cart we see the one that has his helmet and goes in his motorbike. We see the person that's walking and we see the bicycle, right? And these are ways of really looking at reality with this lens of inequality. You immediately pick up that there are inequalities out there. And the question is, are these inequalities something that are gonna really jeopardize the development of the children in these families. Next slide, please. And the question again, are we gonna go backwards? Are we gonna allow these disasters that are coming through to go back in all the development that we've created at least that I've witnessed since the 1960s to now in women's working condition, in education for women, in poverty reduction, et cetera, and schooling for many people. Are we gonna allow these disasters to push us back just because we are not willing to work on the root causes, which are in my mind, racism and inequality. Next slide, please. So I put this here because I, you know, I moved to Puerto Rico back in 2011. Um, I was working with immigrant families at that point, and I realized that we were having the largest demonstrations in the United States since the Vietnam War. And in the next couple of years, we were regressing and going backward to um, everything that we had done for immigrants. And I never thought, I mean, I never thought that I would see what has happened in the last 10 years since I've been there. So what are we good at in the US? We're good at attributing social economic problems to personal responsibility. I don't think I need to explain that to every single one of us. But we're also for that matter, because it's an individual argument, we prefer individual interventions. We teach, we give information, rather than having systemic change. We create very good at creating single individual smaller programs that do not address the root, but address the symptoms of what's going on. And I'm being really harsh here. I'm really saying, you know, this is what I've observed in the last 40 years of my life living in the US. We compete with each other, even if we have the same goals. And we always see the other, whatever that other is, as deficient and dangerous in need of our informed, well-intended intervention. And what I'm saying is that, that that sort of framework, that theoretical framework, as I said, my grandmother used to have a theoretical framework about children and what needed to be done, very different than mine, um, give us so much you know, so much. We feel good about five to 10% increase when the next 90 or 80%, it's still in the same condition. Let's go, the next one. 
And this is what I think we need to be doing. I think we need to be acknowledge, acknowledging racism. And as painful as it can be, really think about how our privilege, I am a privileged woman of color. I took an airplane and I became a woman of color uh, when I moved into the, into the USA. I remember when once we went to a policeman and the policeman report came back to us and I said to my children, I show them and I said, look, your mommy is a person of color. Look, there's a box here that the person showed up, um, put on, on me. So I've been categorized and you have to be aware of what those categorizations are. We are not good in the US at acknowledging that we don't have equal opportunities. That inequality is a national problem that inequality is as important to attack as anything else, obesity, cardiac arrest. Actually, if we deal with inequality, we might not have the obesity that we have. We might not have the cardiac and cancer rates that we have. We are not good at dealing with the roots of the problem and working systematically really thinking about all those different systems and how they interact and forget about prevention. You know, we're very good academics. I think we love prevention um, and it doesn't translate to systemic changes at the level that we want out there. Can I have the next slide, please? This is from the developing child at Harvard education. I work with um, a group on looking at toxic stress. And I just thought that this was a quite an, a pertinent a quote. Put simply, the structural legacies of racism and other cross-generational traumas may be linked to levels of chronic stress that increase susceptibility to the kinds of health impairments that result in greater risk of harm from COVID-19. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is from the developing child. Really, this is them trying to put really simply that we need to deal with reducing the sources of stress for families of color or minoritized populations. That if we think about stress as one of the mechanisms by which structural inequality affects the family and the children's development, we really need to be dealing with not something that teaches you how to be a good parent, not, or not only something that teaches you to be a good parent, or not only that teaches you how to be, you know, teach your child, but all the other sources of stress need to be dealt with. These are comprehensive interventions. Can I have the next slide, please? Another way of thinking about it is, you know, you cannot change the stress that some of these families have because they're so entrenched, but you can really load up the positive side of interventions, really giving them a, a way of coping, a way, you know, maybe subsidizing their income, anything that will bring about some positive change. Next slide, please. And of course, you can move the fulcrum. You can really move the socioeconomic or the segregation or the racism and really moving them to a completely different place where by itself, the fulcrum will be more level. So this is at the individual level. Let's go to the next one. Other ones is working with communities. And I think that the way that we should be doing this kind, if we wanna prevent what has happened with the pandemic is that we need to have people working at the individual, working at the community, working at the policy, but coordinated, not one here, one there, and one there, and hoping that we're gonna be supporting each other. So this gives you a sense that within the black community, they really think that working at the community level is the way to go. And we need to hear that. 
We need to hear that communities are gonna let us know the best way to intervene with them. Next slide, please. So this is the hard message. We need to integrate systems in our study at the National Academy of Science, everybody who was working at health, education, uh, families, um, all the different problems we basically said, everybody is doing their own thing. There's no connection. There's no really supporting each other to a way that it will be systematic, long lasting, et cetera. So easier said than done, but I, right now we have a trillion dollar coming down. So if I would be having this conversation with Mr. and, and Dr. Biden, I would be saying the funding would come not to individuals, not to individuals, NGOs, not to individual hospitals, not to individuals, but it would push. If you're gonna receive money, you have to be working at the systemic level. You have to be talking. The police force has to be talking with the healthcare. The education has to be talking with the healthcare. Everybody has to be connecting to, with each other. And there is no way that you're gonna be receiving funding just to keep on doing independent at one level work. We also need to be enhancing the detection of early life adversity. We have the know-how right now, ACEs and other things that are very much um, looking at, you know, sort of stress or, or um, negative things that have happened in your life. Go to, and can I go to the next one? And in the systems approach, again, this is from vibrant and healthy kids. We have to be able to know our communities. So we need to be working in partnership with communities. We need to be improving access to um, all the things that are there, but coordination, coordinations. And of course, for families with intensive support, that coordination is even more important. Can I have the next slide, please? So the principles that I'm putting down is we need to deal with the structural roots of our society's problem. And for me, those are racism and inequality for this particular populations. We need to support caregivers, not only their children. I mean, if we do this much, we're gonna get this much. The more systems we crook. So if you're working with a child, schools, healthcare, parents, and community would be totally integrated. Of course, prevention and early identification. We need to be culturally sensitive, but if we work with communities, we will be. And of course, it's a systemic, integrated, and coordinated approach. Next one, please. No more Band-Aids. I think that we've tried. I feel sometimes whether we're the little Dutch kid who's putting the finger and the dike is coming apart. We know how to do it. We can try to evidence-based, integrate it, more systemic and more um, intergenerational and more interdisciplinary. Thank you. And I think I went over time as usual. Actually, I think you were right on time. Really? Yeah. Thank you. That was delightful. Thank you so much. Thought provoking as always. Okay. So we have some, we have about 10 minutes um, to Q and A. And so um, we have two questions that have already come in. They're sort of big picture questions, but uh, but I'm dealing with the big picture. You're a big picture thinker. <laughs> so the first one is, um, where do we start to address racial inequality? Economic policy to reduce poverty? And what are the priority steps to dismantle systemic racism? Yep. All right, so we need to look into, for me, education is the main out. Education and a good job, right? Not a job. 
but a good paying job. So I would work with women. This has worked worldwide in Africa and in India and other places where you invest on women's education and you invest on good job opportunities, the whole family moves on. So that would be one that comes right out for me. You know, take all these women that are very, very motivated, that really want to do well and have all the fulcrum in front of them, all the dominoes against them. Let's figure that out. And let's start with the most vulnerable populations, according to the statistics, we have them. So they could be a universal targeted, no? I mean, universal meaning those particular populations. Systemic racism is a harder one. That's a harder one. I mean, I think that we're still on the civil war. I still think that we are, this is, this is what we're dealing with. We never got over the notion that uh, some of us thought the slavery. And, you know, I think about 21st century slavery with, you know, very, uh, very low paying jobs in incredible difficult uh, situations. You know, I've met, you know, I mean, I don't even buy a chicken that it's caught, okay? This is the way that I am. Because I can think about the conditions of the people that caught the chicken and put it out, you know? So I buy my whole chicken, I cut it. I mean, we need to really think about how do we, in our daily life, maintain the systems. I don't buy from Amazon, I'm sorry. You know, it's easy, it's that, but I can't do it. You know, I buy from local, I buy from people. So, you know, there's lots of things that personally we can do that slowly move on. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a consciousness level that we need to get at. And so, you know, the way that I've dealt with small groups talking about racism is, it's the way that I've started. I did it in Wellesley in the 1990s. We were talking about racism across lines of gender and class and race. Really hard conversations have to be dealt with. And you know, I wrote a small paper that talks about how do we come, not racist, but in our worldview, we see the other, the construction of the other by the age of three. Okay, by the age of three, we know what color is value between three and six, it's clearly there. So it has to be multiple prong. It has to be, as I said, it has to be systemic, it has to be personal and stuff. In a hundred years, maybe we'll be over this, I don't know, but if we don't start now and start early and young, you know? Yeah. We're gonna be- Yeah, I would, um just to, I, I'm going to add an uh, amendment to that question, which is, uh, how about childcare? How about childcare? I mean, it's hard to think yeah. about, right? Women, yeah. economy, jobs, right? I mean, also having a robust universal childcare system that takes care would of the providers. And yeah, that would, yeah, and there you would be mostly promoting women and women from the communities in a lot of places and stuff like that. I mean, I used to say to my kids, um, you know, if I if my nanny doesn't have access to the same quality of childcare that I do, then there's something wrong with the system. I mean, yeah. we we really, I mean, those are those are the personal choices that we can make and say. Yeah. Uh, and so my kids used to go. We didn't have we had a nanny, and the the six kids, my three and her three, would grew up together. And on Saturday, they were my six kids, okay? So on Saturday, I would take them to the mall and do things and stuff like that. That was an integrated way of raising six kids. Really um, interesting little insight on the <laughs> theme of integration. Okay, second question. Um, how can the science enterprise be decolonized so that people and communities of color are leading the construction, right. interpretation, and dissemination of research about our communities? Right. This would help ensure there's not a single story about communities of color, the role Absolutely. of editors, funders, researchers, universities. I know I know I can attest to the hard work that you did as editor in chief in child development and kind of the barriers that you faced. The barriers that I yeah. faced. You were part of all those discussions yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, you know, 
here is if you would put of that trillion dollar that is coming down again to some that you know the science cannot be from outside the community anymore mm. that if we're working with communities that are different from the investigators and da, 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 and everything else that we need communities to be part of it. I mean, I think the funding is a major part. Yeah. You know, the United States has, guys, you have the resources. I mean, I don't know, I don't, I don't know anywhere else that I go that it has so many resources and everybody say, oh God, we don't have money for anything. Hello, walk into the second world, walk into the third world. That third world really don't have, I mean, Haiti doesn't have money. Okay, I mean, that's a real place that doesn't have money. So I think the funding streams from NIH, from all the federal government can really start showing the examples of what we want. And of course, states can do that too. So really thinking about how do you push people? You know, you push them. They're not gonna do it by themselves. You have to give them rewards. I'm being very Skinnerian here. You have to give them the, 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 the like, you know, the like instead of the like as you get funding if you blah, 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 blah. Right. Hmm. And do you think so? Um, so this kind of blends into this next question about confronting white supremacist strategies. You know, how do we do that? How does how does one do that? How can should funders, researchers, universities be doing that in a more systematic right. Well, way, yeah. um, right? To really, I mean, systemic change, like you said, is difficult. Difficult. I mean, I'll be the first one to say, hundred years does not sound good to me. Like it needs to be sooner and faster, and and yeah, yeah. Right. You want to buy so your how do we? Right. So right. But what we can create small communities. I mean, there are small communities right now, and I know Chapel Hill and other communities that, you know, that are a lot better. Um, you know, my sense is that this is all about power. It's a power structure, you know? And, you know, since I've been in this field, I've really committed to not only changing the publishing aspects of the field, you know, with developmental psychology and child development, uh, but also the pipeline. I worked a lot with many, many, undergraduate uh, mentoring programs, you know, uh, really, really picking up anybody who has made it at Brown, you know, anybody who had made it to Brown, for me was like a jewel, a diamond, you know, of any of this different students. I work with indigenous groups. I work with, well, I mean, I, I, they were like amazing and like, and my role as a professor there was not only to teach them about child development, but to teach, you know, to really share my experience so they would know the hardship that comes from breaking through, opening doors. One of my students said, you don't open doors for us, you push the door and, you, and then you push us through the door. So you can imagine that, right? So you know me. Um, but, really, but really saying, you know, it's, it, again, it has to be multi-pronged and all of those, distant, you know, the policy maker, the people in the legislatures have to be talking to academia. Academia has to be grounded in communities. It has to be grounded on what's going on. We can't just come from our way of thinking about, you know, um, stuff like that. And so, it has to, I mean, the funding, I'm saying funding, universities, um, federal governments, state governments, think about that the funding has to go for this multi-pronged approaches. Yeah. Um, okay, next question. Um, these are all sort of similar themes, but I think they tap into maybe different threads. So what are ways to address white folks who see and understand all this, but don't want to give up? Or afraid to lose what they have become accustomed to, privilege. And then, is there um, a resource with planning frameworks or implementation frameworks that align with the areas you outline towards equity and inclusion? So, one sort of a conceptual framework question, and another is, um, right. what are ways to kind of address people who don't want to give up privilege? Right. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants to give up power and privilege. Right. Yeah. I know. 
um, that's that's life. This is a battle. This is not. This is not. Uh, you know, the other day I had a conversation with somebody that that gives me a framework to think about this. This is a battle until we find commonalities. Okay. So we were going, there was this person in our neighborhood, which I live in a very mixed neighborhood. My, my, the house next to me is a wooden house, you know, made and it was gone with Maria versus mine, you know, stayed and everything else. And this guy came into the neighborhood and he uses very loud music, very loud music. We are five or six of us. We are like, oh my God. So one of the neighbors put a querella, you know, and said, we're gonna take you to court. And, you know, we have a date. Take him to he comes in and he starts yelling and screaming and everything and da, da, da. And we were confrontational and my husband and him and you know, the testosterone going off. And, um, and I say, you're married, right? And he said, yes. How many kids do you have? And he said, two. And I said, oh, I would love to meet your kids. I'm a child psychologist and I love seeing kids. And this man, all of his, oh, I'm the man here, I'm el macho, I'm going to do this. You can't tell me what to do. This is da 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 da. Melted. <laughs> My husband was looking at me like, how the hell did you do that? You know? <laughs> You know, I couldn't figure out where we were gonna get our commonality. Yeah. You know, where, where are we the same? And you have all of this and I have nothing. Where, where can we work something that all of our neighborhoods are the same way? Or, and I used to say in Providence, if you think that a child that drops out of a school is not your problem, because it is in the next neighborhood. Think about who's gonna be the workforce that it's gonna be measuring your blood levels in the nursing home. And there would be this silence, you know, and I would say, think. The growing community here is Latino and black. And the Latino and black are not making it through high school. Who's gonna take care of you in your nursing home? Just give it a thought. Yeah, excellent. Um, so I'm so sorry we can't cover many of the other um, things that have come up in the chat. We are out of time. Um, this okay. has just been super delightful, Cynthia, to see you and to really have so. time with you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia Call. Um, thank you for reminding us about root causes and focus on commonality. And thank you to Lisa for leading us in that Q&A. Thank you to all of you who joined us. Remember to click on the link in the chat to give us some feedback on today's um, session. We'd also like to invite you to a session on Thursday with the Reverend Dr. Starsky Wilson, the president and CEO of the Children's Defense Fund. Okay. Dr. Wilson will be talking about child well-being and racial justice and how they're intertwined. A nice follow-on to tonight's session. And you can see the link in the chat to register. Thank you again, Dr. Garcia Call, and thank you everyone for joining mm -hmm. us. Good night. Bye.